Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a nuestro encuentro de hoy. Una pequeña reseña histórica de la razón por eh, realizar ECODES esta actividad. Hace 30 años, en 1992, Río de Janeiro acogió la cumbre de la Tierra. Dio lugar a una declaración sobre medio ambiente y desarrolló un nuevo paradigma sobre la relación de las personas con la naturaleza. En este entorno se encuentra el origen de nuestra fundación. Un número pequeño de personas tuvo la iniciativa de eh, impulsar un nuevo modelo de sociedad, que digo que era conveniente, enfocado a, concepto, a los conceptos que nos dan nombre y que deberían ser compatibles. Ecología y desarrollo. Trabajamos desde entonces para conseguir maximizar el bienestar de las personas siempre dentro de los límites de la biosfera. Y dentro de los actos de nuestro 30 aniversario, decidimos que además de ser tiempo de actuar, era tiempo de reflexionar. Y qué mejor hacerlo con Autores de libros y pensadores que nos aportan herramientas para el necesario cambio cultural que requiere la transición ecológica. El formato previsto es un diálogo y hoy tenemos la satisfacción de contar con Roman Kuznarik. No sé si pronuncio bien el apellido, Kuznarik. Muchas gracias, Roman, por tu colaboración con ECODES. Roman es un filósofo nacido en Australia, cuyos libros se han centrado en el poder de las ideas para cambiar la sociedad y se han publicado en más de 20 idiomas. Fue nombrado por el The Observer como uno de los principales filósofos populares de Gran Bretaña. Es miembro fundador del cuerpo docente de The School of Life in Londres fundador del primer museo de empatía del mundo y asesor en materia de empatía de organizaciones como Intermont Oxfam y las Naciones Unidas. Es miembro investigador de la Fundación Long Now y miembro del Club de Roma. Roman es autor de varios libros, el último y en el que hemos fijado hoy nuestra atención es El buen antepasado de Good Ancestor, que será objeto del encuentro con Pilar Ballet Robinson, a nuestra izquierda. Pilar es consultora de comunicación estratégica para el cambio social y fundadora de la empresa social La Mar de Gente. Pilar es miembro del Consejo de ECODES. Muchas gracias, Pilar, también por tu colaboración. Y yo, sin más, ya... Dejo que Roman y Pilar nos ayuden a reflexionar sobre el contenido de El buen antepasado. Thank you very much, José Ángel. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity of being here today and learning about this very interesting and also challenging book. Um, I must say that um, The Good Ancestor has now a space in the must-read recommendations shelf in my library. So um, if you haven't read it Sorry, yet. sorry. Eh, I, uh, he olvidado decir dos cositas. Una, eh, para eh, escuchar eh, directamente en inglés o la traducción simultánea, hay que pulsar un, una esfera, un símbolo que hay... Eh, abajo en la pantalla que pone interpretación y asimismo para cualquier pregunta o cualquier eh, aclaración que se pretenda pueda darse al final hay un chat donde eh, estamos al tanto para escribir la pregunta perdona perdona Pilar no worries um, yep I was just saying that um, the good ancestor has now a space in the, in my library in the shelf for must-read recommendations when people say, what can I read? Okay, I think this is one of the books that uh, we need to read and find the time to reflect and, and give a thought about many issues 
that we will try to cover um, today. Mm. Hi, Roman. How are you? I'm very well. It's such a privilege and pleasure to, to be here with you. And I'm really looking forward to where our conversation travels. Yeah, me too. I'm very excited. Mm, the cover, the book covers many, many fundamental issues to understand where we are heading as a civilization and what our role is as individuals, what role we can play. Some of the issues we will try to cover today. But I would like to start the conversation with these words from your book. A good ancestor knows a dying system when she or he sees one. And instead of trying to pass on her dysfunctional civilization to the next generation, she participates in the historical act of seeding a new civilization that can replace it and maintain the conditions that allow, allow for life in the future. So I'll go straight to the point. Are we on time? to be good ancestors? Well, it's certainly clear that we have a dysfunctional system that we're looking at. We can see it right now in COP27 in Egypt, where we have nations arguing with each other while the planet burns and species disappear. And we've known that in 30 years of meeting since Egolos was founded, how much progress have we really made? I mean, you ask somebody how much of CO2 emissions diminished since the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, and most people think, oh, they've probably gone down a bit. Well, no, they have more than doubled, right? And if you read the scientific literature around the climate crisis, we know that we are approaching or may have crossed key tipping points of um whether it's the melting of the Iceland, uh, the Greenland ice sheet or the melting of permafrost in Siberia. And in that sense, perhaps we are too late. Maybe we are too late, but we don't know. What we do know is that every action we take to be good ancestors, to try and address the ecological crisis, but also other crises around technological risks, but particularly ecological crisis, everything we do makes a difference. Every 0.1 degree makes a difference to the lives of people both in the global south today and future generations to come. So I'm operating on the assumption that it is not too late because every single degree does count. So we can all, in a way, become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. You mentioned in your book that one of the keys to become a good ancestor is to develop a stronger sense of intergenerational justice. Could you maybe explain this concept a bit further? Yes. I think a lot of people, a lot of people like talking about long-term thinking, but long-term thinking or isn't always good for us. Um, you know, in my book, I talk about the idea of cathedral thinking. So like you know, Gaudi building the Sagrada Familia or laying the first foundation stones in 1882 and you know, not knowing if it would ever be finished within his lifetime. And that's a kind of capacity that human beings have to think on the, on the scale of decades or even possibly centuries, like the cathedral builders and mosque builders and synagogue builders for the last thousand years. And we need that. We don't need more cathedrals. We need the ecological cathedrals of the future, of course. Um, but long-term vision by itself is not enough. A former head of the investment bank, Goldman Sachs, once said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. So a lot of long-term thinking can be directed towards something very narrow. And that's why we also need the idea, not just of long-term thinking, but of intergenerational justice, which is the idea of thinking about the long-term, not in a narrow way, but in terms of a, a broader way, thinking about what impact will our actions have on the multiple generations to come. And we find these ideals in many cultures. So the Native American ideal of seventh generation decision-making, making decisions looking up to seven generations ahead, that has intergenerational justice uh, at its heart. And I think the challenge 
we face in, in, a, in a way is to bring the voice of those future generations into politics and economics and society and culture today. That's the real challenge. A world of intergenerational justice is one where we, you know, we, we're surrounded by the living, the dead and the unborn in a way all around us when we're making decisions. Um, as you said um, just now, we are like very narrow in, in our minds. We're like obsessed with the now and the here. And I'm sure for many people out there, the future seems like an empty place, you know, and they might think, what for? Why should we change our way of life? Why should we care for people that we might never know about? I mean, so, so with a big number of people thinking this way, how can we start building those crucial bridges between generations? How can we shift this short-term culture towards a much longer vision of our role in time? It's a very important question. I mean, the, the great comedian Groucho Marx once said, um, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? You know, and I think a lot of people think that and feel that for good reasons. They are dealing with job insecurity. They're a refugee. They're trying to put food on the table right here, right now. So why should we care about the future? Well, it's partly anthropological. You know, most of us might know our, have known our parents and grandparents. And if we have children, we might know that we'll have children and grandchildren. And that immediately puts us in a expanse or a span of five generations. You know, the, if you think of the date that your grandmother was born and the date that your grandchild, if you have children, might die, maybe there's two or 300 years, you know. And most people feel something beyond themselves, partly through these family relations. And in fact, when I'm talking to you know, politicians or, I don't know, business people or whatever, people who may you might think are immersed in their own egoistic present moment. One of the things I do with them is I get them to, even when on a Zoom call, I get them to close their eyes and imagine a young person in their life who they really care about, maybe their child or nephew or niece or something, and then I get them to imagine that young person 30 years in the future. Then I get them to imagine that person 90 years in the future. I ask them to look out the window with their eyes shut, imagining what kind of world it is out there. I ask them to imagine that young person on their 90th birthday giving a speech about what they, their dead ancestor, did for future generations. And the reason I do that is because there are ways of connecting us with the future, even if we have present concerns. Um, and let me say one other thing about this, which is, I think is very important. You know, even I don't think thinking about the future is a matter of privilege in the sense that you might say, ah, well, it's, you know, people in comfortable middle class lifestyles who can worry about the future. But if you're a refugee, you know, you're just trying to deal with the present moment. But I remember talking to my father about this, who was a refugee from Poland to Australia after the Second World War. And he reminded me, he said, you know, people who are, say, coming across the Mediterranean on boats from North Africa or other places, you know, they are thinking about their futures, he said. They are taking risks today with a baby in their arms because they want to give their children a better future. So that kind of thinking, I think, transcends in many ways our social position, that capacity and desire to think beyond the here and now and to care beyond the here and now. Um, I believe it would be helpful to shape and spread a different concept of progress, you know, less linked to economic growth, and more to uh, planetary prosperity, as you describe in, in the book. Um, you also say that no country has been able to keep its economic growth while reducing its greenhouse, em its greenhouse gas emissions. So what kind of progress can we realistically have 
to make our future possible. And I, I want, I, I underline the word realistically because we can all have like these dreams of the future, but with the current present, with the challenges that we are facing, what kind of progress can we actually have? Yeah, I mean, the question of economic growth is huge and vital. Um, you might know that in the last about two weeks ago, the great uh, American ecological economist Herman Daly died. And his thinking, Herman Daly, is so fundamental to, I think, addressing this question. You know, as you know, or people listening may know that Herman Daly, in a way, pioneered the idea that the economy has to be thought about with the biosphere around it. You know, if you learn, if you study economics like I did 30 years ago, you have a demand and supply diagram on the first page of your textbook. Well, Herman Daly said, you know, draw a circle around it. And that circle is the biosphere. That in order to have true long-term sustainability, we can't use more resources than the earth generates and can't create more waste than it can naturally absorb. That's the core idea of ecological economics. And this is the opposite of the idea of economic growth inherited from the 20th century, which is the idea that, you know, GDP, uh, gross domestic product can just keep going up forever and ever and ever. But we know that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, that nothing in nature grows forever, whether it is an oak tree or your children's feet. You know, they Things grow and they reach a point of maturity and then they level off and maybe decay. So I think it's a mythology to think that we can keep growing forever if only we just have the right technologies and so on. But then there's that question, the, the reality check that you mentioned, you know, what is actually kind of realistic? <clears throat> well, I think it's utterly unrealistic to think that we can keep growing like we have, particularly in the global north, in the, the wealthy countries which have been responsible for the greatest ecological destruction. We need to radically shift what our economies look like. And you might think on one level that it's unrealistic to think we can make a radical change because you look at the world, the fossil fuel companies are still there. There's Google and Facebook and all of that. You might think, this is impossible task, you know? But something that really inspires me is I remember reading a very obscure book on the history of energy. And it was pointed out that the Scottish economist, Adam Smith in the 18th century, he didn't even believe the industrial revolution was going on, yet he was right in the middle of it, or at least at the early stages of it. He couldn't see it. And I think, if you look at the world today, particularly in Europe, or you look at Spain, and you connect the dots between the new economic experiments that are going on, the rise of the B Corp movement, which I know you're, you're involved in, the rise of donor economics, the degrowth movement, well-being economies, and so on. Um, you know, Barcelona recently uh, adopted the, uh, the donor economics model, developed, I admit, by my wife, Kate Rayworth, uh, as one of its pillars for uh, its city development, put those together and you see an alternative realistic reality developing. And now let me say one more thing, you know, in a hundred years from now, we might look back at today and see that a, a new regenerative economy was emerging. Not definitely though, maybe not, because maybe we were too late. But I think we could well look back and see that we are part of something that is as important as the shift from feudalism to the industrial revolution it's going on and that's the shift from our sort of neoliberal model to a regenerative economy that exists within herman daly's biosphere within the boundaries of the natural world i don't know what do you think oh well it's a it's a very complex question um i'm always wondering about what exactly what role the economic growth is going to play in all these developments i'm always concerned about how responsible or how mature our politicians are and I always feel like they are going like in different ways you have politicians and decision makers and leaders and all those people going one way and then you see um, people mainly people 
going another way and you're just thinking are they ever going to meet in in a place or is this going to go forever or are we want to one day are we just going to say enough we need to change so yeah i'm always concerned about the economic growth factor yeah i think we can grow other things you know we can Such grow as? well we can grow well-being i mean i think i think i'm right th thinking of the uh, ecoda's sort of uh their strap line is to maximize well-being you know within planetary limits well that's a kind of growth mentality but it's a question of growing something different you know we don't we don't have to grow our bank accounts yeah. And do you see this progress, these new concepts of progress? Um, do you see any seeds coming from COP27 or the uh, E20 that is also taking place this week? Do you see any, you know, we're in a fundamental week of the year where many people, many decision makers are, are meeting and speaking. Do you see anything interesting mm. going on there? No. Mm. Uh, it's my short answer. Um, a slightly longer answer. I remember once reading a book, I don't know if it's near me here, um, I can't see it, by the American historian Howard Zinn. He wrote a book called A People's History of the United States. Very important book. And one of the things he says in that book is that politicians, uh, politics is what happens between elections. In other words, the real change comes from social movements, community activists, citizen you know community activism all sorts of different things the elections are a bit like a sideshow of course they're important but what happens in between is what's really important and i think the same when i think of cop 27 cop 26 cop 25 and going back and back it's actually occasionally they they are important like you know in in paris in 2015 but the real work happens in between it's the movements which which emerge it's the social entrepreneurs inventing post-growth businesses it's well something else actually did happen today in vienna i was just reading before i came on this call some um uh climate activists threw a kind of black paint over a gustav klimt painting in vienna right and this is happening all over europe right throwing mashed potatoes at a german painting throwing uh red pa uh, orange soup at a van gogh painting in london and this is the radical flank movement, you know, groups like Just Stop Oil. This is the politics that's happening now, which is, I think, the significant stuff. Um, I don't think it's really what's happening at COP, you know, COP27. Um, yeah. But it's true that we do see some uh, steps coming from uh, public institutions like the EU, you know, they're kind of trying to regulate, to um, maybe um, set the uh, basics for a common language, even, you know, yeah. the same, trying to use the same um, framework when we speak about sustainability or corporate responsibility. So we do see some kind of small, but also important steps from the public administration. Yeah, I think that happens. And in fact, about a month ago, um, the president of the EU, Ursula van der Leyen, in her um, State of the Union address, which she gives every year. Amazingly, she said in that that all future EU treaties should be guided by the idea of intergenerational solidarity. Right, and she said we should be doing things for the next generation, and that's really, of course, it's just a political speech, but actually, it's very important because it helps set the framework for. A lot of the work the EU is doing and will be doing around green deals and so on. It's not that I think those things aren't important. I just think that the place where they the change tends to come from is from the disruptive movements coming from below. And that pushes the politicians and the policymakers just that little bit further because they're always too conservative by nature. You know, they're in conservative institutions and we need to shift the window of what seems normal. So the this goes connects very much with what the, the the activists throwing paint on the paintings are all about, which I know a lot of people find difficult. Like my mother-in-law says, oh, my God, that's terrible. Well, what they're doing is something historically important, which is what's called the radical flank effect in social movement theory, which is the idea that you have a mainstream movement. So take, for example, the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. You have a mainstream movement led by Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights movement, 
But alongside that, you had a more radical movement, the Black Power Movement, right? And the Black Power Movement's role was really to, in a way, almost scare the establishment, the policymakers into accepting the civil rights movement, right? To, and made what the civil rights movement was asking for seem normal. Yeah. And so I think all of these play into shifting what comes out of public policy, which, you know, as, as you're knowing, as you know, and as you say, sets the absolutely vital regulatory frameworks for things like creating a circular economy, for example. I guess we we need to see the extreme to find each other in the midway, in the middle way, right? Yeah, I think um, that's right. You were saying before, um, when I meet people, politicians or people that are maybe um, a bit harder or not so much into thinking about the future, and I ask them to imagine a young person that they care for in, let's say, 60 years time, 50 years time. Um, however, Trying to do this and imagining the future, it's very, very difficult. And we've seen this in many occasions, you know, people trying to predict things that never happen and the other way around, things happening that never have, nobody ever predicted, like the pandemic or maybe uh, the scale of the pandemic or maybe uh, internet when it was born, um, the war in Ukraine this year, you know, things are happening and we couldn't foresee them. So it's very difficult to imagine this. Guillermo Altares, um, we interviewed him a couple of weeks ago in this cycle of encounters also, and um, he maintains that history does not repeat itself. Do you agree with him? Well, I think Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, but history does rhyme, you know, and there are patterns in history, right? We know there are patterns in history, but let me just go back earlier to your question. I think, um, you know, when I think about the uncertainties of the future, yes, it's true. The future is incredibly uncertain. How can you do long-term thinking around the technological future? I don't know if the year 2049 will be like the film Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049 and the machines have taken over. Who knows? You know, will we have artificial general intelligence? Who knows? So there's uncertainty in that technological area. But there is an enormous amount of certainty in the ecological area. We know more about the ecological future than we have ever known in many ways, because thousands of climate scientists uh, have been working on creating models around what's going to happen to sea level rises or temperature rises over the next 100 years. We basically know that with business as usual, we'll get one to two meters of sea level rise, maybe three to four degrees of heating. Of course, there's variation, but we know what's coming. We absolutely know what's coming. But with respect to what um, uh, Guillermo and, and Terras said, um, I think the opposite, in fact, about history. I think history is full of lessons and inspiration that we can learn from. Now, I partly say that because, and this is a bit of a secret, I'm writing a new book at the moment about what we can learn from history to deal with the great challenges facing society, climate change, inequality, the threats from artificial intelligence, immigration, all sorts of issues. And just to take one random example that we can learn from in history, um, a Spanish example. I mean, as you know, and I'm sure many people in, on this call know that every Thursday at 12 o'clock outside the west door of the cathedral in Valencia, there is a meeting and the meeting of the Tribunal de las Aguas, right? The Tribunal of Waters, which has been meeting for hundreds of years to manage water resources in the Valencia agricultural hinterland, right? Where there's eight or nine of these democratically elected representatives, most of the men, I admit, so it has its limitations. But as we know, this is a tradition of commons water management going back from before the reconquest, yeah, you know, and um, the great Eleanor Ostrom, the you know the the person who wrote so much about the Commons and won a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Nobel Prize in economics for it, she wrote all about the Tribunal de las Aguas. She loved it, right? That's just one example that we can look from. I know of Palestinian water experts who are fighting the Israelis, stealing their water from under the West Bank. These Palestinian experts 
look to the Valencia example and water management in Murcia and other places, the history of it, to say, maybe we should use models a little bit like that. These models are not perfect, but there's something we can take from the past because the present is not unique. You know, people have been struggling with water problems for thousands of years. I mean, the whole, you know, in China, the Chinese word for politics is water management. That's what politics is. Yeah. So interesting. There's so many stories, you know, that open your mind and make you think about so many other issues. It's um, really inspiring. Um, let's go back to thinking about long term. And we were saying that to face today's challenges, we need to um, plan long term. However, some people believe that guaranteeing the sustainability of the planet through long-term planning will entail limiting our rights and our freedoms. And we've seen that in history too. Is this something that could happen? Well, I have to give a big answer to this because it's such a big question. You know, human freedom has always had limits put on it, okay? Now, in the 18th century, let's say before the 18th century, in Europe, people thought they had a right to have a slave make their dinner for them and to serve them. They had, thought, thought they had a right to own another human being. Okay? And then in the 18th and 19th centuries, there were social struggles against this. And the, the right to own another human being to make your coffee disappeared in, in many ways, not completely. Okay. And so a limitation was put on freedom. Other limitations were put on freedom in the 19th century, limitations on working hours. In the 20th century, limitations on how fast you could drive your car. There are always limits put on freedom. So freedom is something that's always up for negotiation, and it depends on the context. Right Now, so this is a kind of a, an aspect of political theory. Um, the problem is that freedom, the context of freedom is changing today. I can wave my hand around. I might knock the glass off my desk. But what happens now is as a society, as a global society, our hands and arms are moving in more and more directions, up, down and around, and we're knocking over more and more things. You know, that's the impact we're having uh, with the ecological uh, ecological actions, you know, that fossil fuels and biodiversity loss and all of that stuff. We are knocking over more and more glasses. So we're harming the freedom of others. So we have to put some limits on that. And of course, the limits we need are pretty obvious. Like you should not be allowed to go into a shop and buy an iPhone because an iPhone has huge impacts on the environment, right? On uh, mineral usage, where's the lithium going to come from, throw away electronic waste, and so on. You should only be allowed to buy something like the Dutch Fairphone, which is modular and made of recycled things and so on. Um, this is completely obvious, but we shouldn't think of that as a, as something necessarily bad. It's just a, a new limit on freedom, like the abolition of slavery. right? But there will still be freedom of other kinds left in the world, freedom to fall in love, to dream, to start a business which is within ecological limits. You know, limits aren't bad. Um, you know, Mozart wrote on a five octave piano. You know, Serena Williams played within the lines of the tennis court. Jimi Hendrix on a six string guitar. Boundaries create innovation. That's what I would say. So there's plenty of still plenty of freedom you can have. It's just you know, reasonable about our harm on others. Yeah, sorry, however, sorry, that was such a long answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, um, yeah, I think these questions have no easy answers. You know, big problems have never easy answers or easy solutions. Um, I was thinking just now after what you were just saying that I guess we we need a big crisis that challenges and maybe threatens our survival like what we had during the pandemic uh, in 2020 you know like we did have like we limited our freedom from one day to the other and there was all this you know anxiety and everybody started doing things that a month before we would have thought was completely out of the uh, you know you know 
something totally some normal and and completely impossible so i guess we need to have it really in front of our eyes and to feel threatened in front of our eyes and i guess this is not really happening with the ecosocial crisis um to answer that question i need to just reach over to a piece of paper hold on for three seconds okay i have returned you probably can't see this very well it's a triangle and it says the triangle of change and this is a kind of model of crisis i've been working on recently this is a secret too i shouldn't be showing you this because <laughs> um, it's not finished and it's, it's sort of a half idea but it's a response to your question this triangle has three corners one says crisis the other one says movements and this says ideas and the point of this is to say that in order to have rapid transformative change as exactly as you say a crisis is not enough you know how many floods do we have to have how many hurricanes do we have to have you know in order to make us sit up and change clearly crisis by itself usually doesn't work you need two other elements the other corners of the triangle you need the new ideas hanging around right new ideas new models new practices we can pick up so for example after the 2008 financial crash many people thought okay we had the crisis but we didn't have the new financial or economic models to take the place of the old system so the old system just continued and we just bailed out gave money to the banks right of course now we've got many more ideas around as we've just been talking about well-being economics and ecological economics and donor economics and so on so you need the ideas and then you need the bottom other corner of the triangle you need the movements as we talked about earlier the disruptive movements so you need all three of those things to happen at the same time right you need the crisis plus the ideas plus the movements and probably a bit of luck as well right um I think that's uh maybe that sounds a little bit theoretical but actually I think that historical shifts often have these three corners to them. So that's why I talk so much about that's why I go onto the street with these direct action movements like extinction rebellion, right? I I'm not a natural agitator. I like you can see here behind me I like books and sitting in libraries and writing books you know but I recognize this moment of history that third corner of the triangle needs a little bit more push push yeah yeah we're going from backwards from history then we go to the future then we go back to history and then to present so um we're going back to history again and um we were thinking about you were saying before yeah I do believe that history repeats itself all the time and we have seen civilizations thrive and then disappear and in the book you do speak about the wisdom of the s curve so do you think humanity will be able to modify the shape of the curve that has happened so many times and change the patron will we be able to influence our future by by creating this um ecological civilization yeah, it's a very difficult question because, you know, as we talked about earlier, the the ideology of growth is a curve that always goes upwards. Um, but we need a curve which is more like the the letter S, one that that evens off. How are we going to do that? Is that really feasible to create that ecological civilization to shift the shape of the curve? Um, one of the things I write about a lot in the when Antepasalo and the Good Ancestor is the importance of politics for changing the curve. Because I think maybe this is a bit unfair, but certainly when I look at a lot of ecological organizations who are trying to do the right thing, I think there's a lot of a lack of focus on changing political systems. Um, I would say this because. I used to be a political scientist 25 years ago. I mean, I'm not anymore, but I used to be, you know, I used to teach about democracy and politics, and et cetera. And um, what I see is that you can have all the social sustainable development goals in the world that you like, but if your political systems are still caught on short-term cycles, 
you know, then you're not going to get very far. So we need to radically rethink the design of politics. But then there's the question of how to do this. Um, and let me just give you a couple of ideas. In fact, I need to stand up again. I need to put on a my special Japanese robe. Espero momento. Wait. Okay. Now you might wonder, what is this guy wearing? This is a robe from Japan, but it's not a normal kimono. It is from a radical political movement in Japan called Future Design. And Future Design is inspired by the Native American idea of seventh generation decision making, which I mentioned before. But what they do, they've adapted it for Japan. It's about local government decision making. So they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And they usually divide them into two groups. Half are told they are residents from the present day. And the other half are given these ceremonial robes to wear and told to imagine themselves being residents from the year 2060. And it turns out the residents from 2060 systematically advocate for much more radical and transformative plans for the towns and cities, whether it's investment in water infrastructure, dealing with biodiversity loss, dealing with the problems of automation, many, many things. And this movement has now spread around Japan. It's even being used in big cities like Kyoto, Japan's Ministry of Finance. This is one of the ways of changing the shape of the S-curve. And it connects to something bigger that's happening across Europe, which is the rise of citizens' assemblies. You know, which, of course, you had in Spain, Belgium, Ireland. I was recently speaking at the Ireland's New Citizens Assembly on Biodiversity Loss. It's about engaging people, citizens, in decision-making, because a citizen assembly where you randomly select people tends to have a much longer-term perspective than your short-term regular politicians. Um, you know, it's sometimes called the deliberative wave of a new kind of democracy. In a way, it's a bit like the ancient Greek kind of democracy, but not just for men. Um, and I think this is just one of the ways where we're changing the design of politics, maybe too slowly, but it's quite exciting. And I think this is going to help create the right shape of civilization, more of an S than a, an upward curve. Let's go a little bit further down. You spoke about Japan. Let's go to China. Uh, which is lately very much on media, as we all know. Um, you know, China is the uh, the country with more greenhouse gas emissions in the world, and they have started their green revolution. However, we know that, again, the economic growth ambitions that they have for the next decades are still there. So this is, like, very confusing for people. Like, what is your opinion in this? Is this... An optimistic sign? Is this just more confusion, more disinformation? How can we receive all this happening? Ah, I wish I had a good answer to that. I mean, there's certainly a contradiction, as you say there, that, um, you know, on the one hand, Xi Jinping might talk about the ecological civilization. On the other hand, they basically have 6% growth targets, you know, and these things cannot meet. We know that by in 2050, China will probably still have 40 or 50% of its energy coming from fossil fuels, okay? That is a disaster. So is the fact that the, the global north has been emitting carbon for 200 years and is not willing to pay money to countries in the global south to help them in a transition towards post-carbon economies. Um, and where is it going to go? I mean, it's very difficult to say, and I, I, I wish I knew a, a better answer to that. Um, yeah, who knows what will happen? I mean, the problem, of course, is that as people get wealthier, they consume more stuff, right? And so we know that the amount of meat being consumed in China, you know, is starting to move towards what it is in the Western world. But it's still the case that, you know, the Europe and North America have way more of a uh, they take up far more of their fit than their fair share of carbon emissions and other ecological footprint impacts than 
China or India or all these other places. It's a bit too easy to blame China, I think. Mm, I agree. However, um, do you think these first steps towards this green revolution is something we can think of being a step forward? I mean, maybe it's just a little step, but just the fact of speaking about it and maybe then take them taking some steps in this sense is something positive or not really? Or it's too early to know. Well, I mean, all steps are positive. I, You know, in a way, I think maybe this sounds like too much me thinking as a sort of philosopher, but I think that the language that we talk about these issues is as important as those, you know, the new solar panels being built. You know, that one of the reasons I wrote The Good Ancestor, the Buen Antepasalo, was to try and create a new language to talk about these issues that we all care about, right? <laughs> you know, um, so the whole idea of being a good ancestor, that idea is a is a metaphor. You know, the idea that ah, we might be judged by future generations is a much better to me. Talking about being a good ancestor is more powerful than being a than talking about just future generations because future generations is something out there. It's away from me. A good ancestor is me. You know, am I or am I not? Or in the book, I talk about the idea of colonizing the future. You know, again, another metaphor, as you mentioned earlier, that we treat the future as an uninhabited territory that we use for dumping our problems on it. And I I really believe that the, the paradigm changes come as much from these way we talk, the way we think, as in the actual policies themselves. I think a really interesting example of this is the idea of the rights for nature. Um, so, you know, one of the big changes going on in the last 10, 20 years is the idea that not just that future generations might have rights and there are legal cases going on like this, probably some of the most important legal cases since the French Revolution around rights, but also the idea that a mountain or a river could have rights. And of course, we've seen that in Spain with the, the ruling around the, uh, is it the Mar Menor, you know? And and in New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where rivers have been given rights, these seem like small policy steps, but they're a big change in mentality. You know, in the 19th century, corporations were given rights in the United States. You know, we're still living with the legacy of that. Yeah, you know? let's hope that the idea of giving rights to the living world might be a, a mental shift, just as important. I really like the idea about giving rights or protect, protecting the rights of those of those future generations. I think that's a key um, reflection that we need to start thinking about much more seriously as something that can happen. As you know, we have regulated the rights of the unborn children, also about the rights of people in um, in a vegetative state. So why not regulating the rights of those that haven't even been conceived? And I think that's a really um, interesting point that we should start thinking about as, as a society ourselves. I also really like the figure of the custodians of the future that you mentioned in your book. So can you tell us a little bit more about these figures and what is a role in challenging our current systems or uh, governments or, I don't know, thinking? <laughs> Well, I think the idea of being a custodian of the future, um, we can all do that. In fact, not long ago, I, I um, was involved in a sort of a music and arts festival in England where I worked with a um, theater producer and we trained a whole bunch of students to be guardians of the future. They wore amazing costumes like from the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's album, uh, and they had little hats that said Council of the Future on it. So, they were, And they went all around this music festival, this arts festival, just talk, having conversations with people about the future, about how they thought about the future, about what being a good ancestor meant to them. And I think that that's, you know, there that's a realm in the arts space where we can do that. But of course, we can do that in the politics space and in the economic space. We can do it through being an impact investor or being a, a deep time artist, taking a photograph whose exposure is for a thousand years. You know, all of these are part of changing what I think of as the 
ethnosphere. Now, that's not a word in English and probably not a word in Spanish either, but you know, we have the biosphere, right, which is the air we breathe. Well, I think of the ethnosphere as the cultural air we breathe. It's all those ideas and assumptions and things which shape our views of the world. And we need to be doing that work through theater and dressing up and, you know, as much as in politics. Um, I think that's partly how we become a custodian. Of course, the idea of a custodian also has sort of religious sort of resonance too. And that's why if you read um, the Pope's last encyclical, Laudato Si, praise be, he talks there about being a custodian, you know, that we should be custodians, that the earth is just something that we're, we're borrowing for a while and we pass it on, you know. He talks about intergenerational solidarity. So the language of being a custodian, I think, can work for lots of different kinds of people. I guess the University of Barcelona has also is also turning into a custodian of the future because um, this week they said they are going to introduce like a, a subject on ecosocial crisis in all its degrees from the yeah, next academic fact, year. I, I, I told my children about that. I sent them an article. My children are 14. And I said, you know, go to the University of Barcelona <laughs> when 18 if you can. Um, yes. I mean, it'll be, I'm really interested in how they're going to decide what's in that that course or in that curriculum. Or if it's obligatory to, curve, yeah, to, yeah, know, to but, but, go through it. Yeah, and we'll see how they develop the content of it. Will they crowdsource it? Or I, I don't know how they're going to do it, but I thought that's pretty good. Yeah, however, it's it kind of it makes you think, why haven't we done this before? It doesn't seem like a, such a complex thing to do, you know, you know, having like educational programs from the national states just um, or maybe the uh, regional authorities you know putting up these programs with minimum content related to the ecosocial crisis why is it taking so long to get things that should be easy and reasonable and non-political yeah. why i mean of course in a way we have done it before in the 19th century when public education was invented around europe we invented literacy you know now we're asking for ecological literacy you know but those struggles in the 19th century took a long time You know, and in fact, they required strong states, strong governments to, in a way, impose these new new curriculum. I mean, I've tried to influence education myself and failed terribly. Um, I worked with Oxfam or Intermon Oxfam um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago to try and get the subject of empathy to become a school subject in Britain so that children aged, say, five, 10, 12 would be taught about emotional intelligence as much as mathematics and history or whatever. Um, but the uh, conservative government came along and they just ripped up our ideas, which were actually starting to have some influence and the whole thing died. You know, So changing education is so fundamental, but really difficult. Um, but I think in, in, the, in the area that we're talking about now, I think what's very exciting is that Students themselves are rebelling. They're refusing to be taught this sort of 20th century neoliberal economics, for example. They are calling for something different. Um, you know, that's probably a good thing. That might speed up the process a bit. Hopefully, yeah. So um, we could go on for hours and hours, Roman, speaking about this. There's so many issues we can discuss, and it's so interesting. So before we go to question time, because um, it's going to be an hour almost, I would like to finish this part with one of your reflections in the book. I'll, I started with one. I'm going to finish with another one. And you write, I wish we could all breathe the air that our children and grandchildren will breathe when with difficulty in the future. I wish we could feel the heat feel the hunger, feel the insecurity that they may be facing. As we said before, it's very difficult for us to imagine the future as a whole, but we can somehow sense how it will feel like, you know, how what the air will be. So I think this is a really strong and powerful paragraph. Without being pessimistic, I guess this is something we need to keep reminding ourselves to go back to basics and think about something so fundamental, so crucial to our survival as the air that we will breathe. And I really like the expression or the concept of the atmosphere, which is the cultural air 
that we will breathe. So that's like another twist on this um, this reflection. Um, I guess now we need to ask ourselves, what am I going to do about it? How, as a citizen, am I going to put my part? How, how, how am I going to do my part? How I'm just a one little ant in this huge, huge, huge world. So, yeah, how can we answer to this? Well, I think we need to think beyond the individual for a start. You know, we're clearly past, past the time of changing the light bulbs in our, by ourselves in our house. It's about collective action. Um, it's about changing culture. It's about, you know, shifting what seems as normal. Now, collective action takes many forms. It's not just about, you know, going onto the streets with Extinction Rebellion or the equivalent movements. It's also things we do in our everyday lives, but which can have a wider effect. So let me just give you a, a small example. So about a year and a half ago, my wife and I decided to give up our car, our fossil fuel car. And it was quite a difficult thing because we've got children and they'd want to go to football matches on the weekend and all this kind of stuff. And we're lucky we live in a small city, Oxford, population 130,000, which has a good cooperative car club. So when we gave up our car, we had the option now within about a five minute walk, we can walk to about six different cooperative cars which we can rent just by the hour using a small app but the more people who join the more of these cars that they can put in our neighborhood then the more people who want to join because you can get a car and it has a cumulative effect right and then people also see the fact that we don't have a car outside our house and then they say well how do you take your children to football matches you know and then we can tell them so on one level, that's a kind of an individual action, but it has a sort of a wider resonance. It has a sort of a collective aspect to it. And I think that's the core of this is about finding the collective actions we can do in our family lives, in our schools, universities, businesses, wherever it is. So I would always just start with the, the collective when we're talking about this. Yep. Yeah, I guess we all need to think about transport and so many other things that in our daily life can change. So I'm going to go to the chats where we have a few questions. Um, Juice is asking, do you really think we can achieve a just transition? If your answer is positive, which I hope will be, can you give us some fundamental keys to it? <laughs> okay. Um, can we really have a just transition? <clears throat> we're certainly having a transition right i mean every business wants to be green or pretend to be green right the question really is whether those kinds of shifts going on are taking us onto a genuinely transformative pathway i mean some of you might know the uh, a model called three horizons um dev developed by a guy called bill sharp I wish I had a picture of it. I've got lots of pictures around, but I don't have three horizons. But the basic idea of three horizons is that we need to recognize that our current pathway is one of civilizational decline, like the decline of the Roman Empire, but on a global level. And so the curve is kind of going down. Let's see if I can draw it better. And I think a lot of corporate social responsibility and so on is not fundamentally changing that curve. It's just slowing down the pace of breakdown, you know? And the just transition is about jumping off that curve, not just trying to stretch it out, but trying to jump onto a new curve of radical transformation. You know, and that's some of the stuff we talked about, about radical circular economy, you know, radical decarbonization, radical kinds of regulation, et cetera. Um, so I think we can go there, you know. Um, I think, you know, I'm I make in my work, I make a distinction between hope and optimism you know optimism is the idea that the everything will be okay the glass is always half full well i think that's uh rubbish you know um you know well not rubbish but that's not how i look at the world you know i'm not willing to say everything's going to be okay if the evidence points in the opposite direction 
I think the evidence does point in the opposite direction. You know, we're moving much faster towards breakdown than a just transition. And yet hope, I think, is about grasping onto holding on what you believe is right and fighting for it, even if it's going to be difficult. And I think that's where we are. These are difficult struggles. You know, never has humankind faced this kind of planetary challenge, right? Can we rise to it? I don't know, but I look at enough through history and see, you know, certainly there are moments of crisis going back to the subject we talked about, like in the Second World War, where even the Americans and the Russians cooperated against the Nazis, right? You know, extraordinary things can happen. But in order to give hope, um, genuine hope, you know, what does a just transition really look like? What's my answer to that? You know, where do I where do I see that? I mean, in a way, I see it in my children, right? I see my children say to me, Dad, how could you have taken so many aeroplane flights in the 1990s? In the 1990s, I used to travel to Guatemala a lot for my research when I was an academic. They say, how could you do that? And I said, well, we didn't really know very much about climate change. And my daughter says, well, but the, you know, Rio Earth Summit, 1980, you know, 1992, Jim Hansen's congressional speeches, you already knew about it, you know? And, you know, I tried to explain, well, it, it took a long time to feel it in my bones, you know, and to cut out taking airplane flights and so on. And I think the fact that my children's generation think it's that I was a carbon criminal for much of my life and probably still am in many ways is that's sort of the strongest sign of a just transition to me. It's about a, a generational shift. What the great uh, German sociologist in the 1920s, Karl Mannheim, called the Weltanschauung, the world view. You know, you need to shift how we think. Um, I think that's where I, I find the strongest um, evidence. And, and just connected to that and going back to the subject of growth, I think the fact that there are genuine debates now about whether growth is good or not is a big shift. I mean, just recently in Britain, um, the <laughs> we keep having new prime ministers, but the last prime minister, Liz Truss, said, my goal is growth, growth, growth. And about a week before, the leader of the opposition Labour Party, Keir Starmer, said, my goal is growth, growth, growth. Right. Everyone was only talking about growth. But actually now the Labour Party has shifted um, and is now talking much more in the language of not quite a just transition or Green New Deal, but more in that language and, and has stopped using the language of growth, growth, growth. And there's more debate about whether there's the an emerging post-growth coalition in British politics. And if Britain can start having that debate, then anywhere can, because we are <laughs> so behind the times. Yeah, however it, it can be, I can understand people feeling very confused with all these narratives changing from one day to the next, you know, like, okay, so we want to do the good thing, but one day they say one thing, the next day they say something different, and then people just say, okay, if they don't even know what to do, what am I going to do in my daily life? Um, Victor, he says, don't worry, Roman, those actions against uh, big painters um We'll, oh, don't worry not to not for the sectors of the population not to understand these actions of activism. Um, maybe instead of winning allies to the climate cause, we will lose potential allies. I don't know if I, I translated it correctly. <laughs> yeah, so there's a there's a really important question here with this idea of radical flank movements. Um and thanks for that question, Victor. Uh, there's a very interesting book written by a Swedish social historian and, and climate activist um, called Andreas Malm, M-A-L-M, and it's called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. I imagine it's probably been translated in Spanish. It's quite a radical book. You know, it's advocating this kind of thing. But one of the things he points out, and I think in quite a good, honest way, is that sometimes things like throwing the paint at the painting can alienate more people than bring onto your cause, right? And that's what's sometimes called a negative radical flank effect, not mm -hmm. a positive radical flank effect. Mm 
And I think it's a question of political judgment about whether your action will bring more people along with you or alienate more people, okay? So to give an example of a negative radical flank, some people say that in the 1950s, late 1950s in South Africa, Nelson Mandela was, and the, and the African National Congress realized that the legal mechanisms had failed. So they decided to start a guerrilla movement, right? It was led by Nelson Mandela, yeah? The spear of the nation, it was called. That's why he was jailed for starting a guerrilla movement. And some historians say that by starting a guerrilla movement, he made it very difficult for the non-violent um, anti-apartheid movement to have success. In a way, it was damaging. Now, there's a lot of debate around this. Was it damaging? Was it not? Maybe it was good, maybe not. And I think that's in a way where we are now. We're having these debates about throwing paint onto the um, onto the paintings. Interestingly, just earlier today, I read an article by uh, a British academic whose surname is Pankhurst, Helen Pankhurst. Her great grandmother was one of the suffragettes um, who led the radical movement for women's rights in Britain in the early 20th century. Now, they didn't just throw paint on paintings. They went into the National Gallery with a butcher's knife and sliced open a Caravaggio painting, I think it was, right? They were much more in, you know, radical. Um, and But we now look back on them as being heroines. At my children's school, there's pictures of them on the walls in the classroom. At the same time, the British government is trying to jail people who are doing the same thing, right? Um, and so I think it's it's a very hard one to judge historically. I, pro I think probably my view is that the people who are throwing stuff on, on the paintings um, are, probably bring, are probably having a net positive effect. Now, my immediate instinct is to think, well, isn't it better to target a fossil fuel, um, you know, an oil, an oil tanker or, an, you know, something much more direct than the painting? Well, the thing is, yes and no. They've already tried that and they haven't been getting the media attention. Now, just look at this. Uh, it's extraordinary. So you do lose the support of my mother-in-law, but you actually create a huge public debate. So my guess is that they will be seen historically as being a sort of a net positive radical flank movement you know maybe i'm wrong you know it's a it's a judgment jose angel he asks is there an invisible thread among our di daily acts and the impact they will produce in the future how do you think we can make these more visible oh is there an invisible thread <clears throat> between our daily actions now and in the future and well, the, the impact they will have in the future. Sorry? And the impact they will have in the future. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Open to interpretation. I mean, the first thing it makes me think about is to recognize that never before in history have our actions had such potentially damaging impacts on future generations. Um, in a way, you can trace that back to July the 16th, 1945, when the first atomic test happened. It's called the Trinity test. That was the moment when humanity could destroy the future. Right? But I think we've now added to the nuclear weapons with our ecological impacts, pushing the earth over very dangerous tipping points or towards them. Um, and in a sense, that is the thread. The thread is that when you drive a car, the water rises 100 years from now, right? And we can't see that thread very easily. There's a beautiful um, book by the Italian writer Italo, Italo Calvino um, called Invisible Cities. And if you know that book, it is about Marco Polo telling stories to, to the great Khan in China about the great cities of he has seen. But in fact, all of the cities are the same. 
He's just describing his own city, Venice. And why am I telling you this? <laughs> One of the stories, he talks about how he tells, Marco Polo tells the great Khan about how there is a city where there are invisible threads connecting everybody together. You can't see them. And as you walk through the city, there are all these connections between people. And I think what he's saying there is that we're social animals. You know, we are connected with friends and family and community. And what I take from that, thinking of the question, <laughs> is that those threads are not just in today's world, connecting people we know, but they travel through time. You know, we are connected by invisible threads. The problem is that consumer capitalism slices the thread and leaves us as individuals shopping, <laughs> you know? We, we are connected to our grandparents and our grandchildren and things as we talked about earlier, but the culture is trying to cut those threads. So let us try and rediscover those invisible threads. Um, a very beautiful question. I think there are two more questions and then we will have to close because it's already almost quarter to. So Menchu, she says, I believe that the Football World Cup in Qatar is a step backwards. It was a corrupt decision and the human rights of migrant workers, of uh, homosexuals, women are not respected. But there's no boycott. No one is boycotting mm -hmm. the World Cup and people are just going to be spectators of the matches and nothing else is going to happen. What do you think? Ah, I didn't expect a football question. Always um, football. <laughs> always football. So I remember once making my children, or particularly my son, quite upset uh, when I wrote an article about the Football World Cup many years ago saying that it should be abolished and replaced with a international competition where each team, each country sends its national team, but then they are divided up by their star sign, Sagittarius versus Aquarius versus Leo or whatever. And the reason, of course, I wrote that article is because I have a, an allergy to nation states, you know, because nation states historically have been such fundamental culprits in warfare. Now they are the fundamental culprits when it comes to failing to create global agreements on the climate crisis. So I'm very open to the idea of being critical of the World Cup. And, you know, Qatar is a very good example where we are happy to let entertainment trump rights, rights of migrant workers, rights of women, um, rights of people of different sexual orientations. And I think there's a very good case for you know, boycotting uh, this kind of infotainment um, of the World Cup. Again, it would make my children very unhappy who follow the World Cup very closely. But on the other side, I think it's quite interesting, at least in, in the UK, and I don't know about Spain, but the football has been in many ways very effective at spreading new messages in society, for example, around Black Lives Matter. Um, when footballers wear armbands, rainbow armbands, black armbands, when they take the knee um, in solidarity, they have incredible power. So I would sort of at least hope that maybe some of the you know, teams themselves might use the extraordinary exposure that they have in order to send a message around the derechos humanos, around, you know, human rights and, and things related. Yeah, I guess football is another religion itself, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's re and religions are very powerful and they should be used. You know, I was very pleased when the Pope said, that intergenerational solidarity was uh, an issue that should drive Catholic action. I'm not a Catholic, but, you know, yes, you know. Yeah, extremely powerful and influential, yes. So the last question, um, Manuel, he says, uh, we have to, uh, oh, desterrar, I don't know how to say this in English, just take it away, They'll make it disappear, the comfortability of fatality. You know, people finding it really easy to just say, OK, I'll give up. It's just going to be we're just going to explode. This is not going to work. So I why should I do anything? It's, you know, fatality. What do you think? 
Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible how the human capacity for denial, psychological denial is so strong that in a way, the worse the problems get, the more excuses we find. Um, and we move towards a very negative form of carpe diem, of seizing the day. And when the Roman poet Horace wrote in 23 BC, I think about the idea of seizing the day carpe diem, you know, he was saying, let's, let's live for the moment because death could take us at any moment. And in some ways, I think people's reaction to the ecological crisis is to say, right, I'm just going to, yeah, have a good time. I'm going to fly everywhere. I'm going to pollute. I'm going to so on. And there's another way of thinking about seizing the day, you know, not the idea of carpe diem, but the plural form, carpamos diem, let's seize the day together. And throughout human history, human beings have done that. We have acted collectively to bring about change. That's how child labor was defeated in the United States. That's how women got voting rights. That's how why in Kerala in southern India is one of the most equal states in all of India because there were trade unions and movements that rose up. Um, and I think this is where we have to be aiming for today and recognizing that that's seizing the day energizes us when we do it with others the part of who we are as aristotle said was social animals um, that we don't have to just burn the carbon as quickly as we can um, that there are other possibilities but those possibilities have to be built through everyday action ultimately i think it's about putting a new question in our heads you know steve jobs used to say that he woke up every morning and would say to himself, he'd look in the mirror and say, if this was my last day on earth, what would I do? You know, and that's a real, very individualistic carpe diem mentality. Well, I think we should look in the mirror every morning and ask ourselves, how can I be a good ancestor? You know, and the interesting thing is when you start doing it, it actually can feel pretty good. You know, it can sustain us existentially, you know, I mean, I love the fact that I don't have a car outside my house. You know, it causes inconvenience for, yeah, it's harder to organize our lives and take the children to the football match, right? Um, but at the same time, I feel connected more to future generations, to people in the community. It creates conversations. So <laughs> let's hope that we can find a way that a just transition can also be one that builds community. Um, that builds connection, that creates the invisible threads between the past, the present, and the future. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think this is a great way to end this conversation with this um, Carpe Museum. I think I'm going to really integrate this into my day-to-day. -day. Thank well, you I very to, much. I have to admit that I, I did write a book about it called Carpe ah. Museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will note that book too then. Thank you again very much, Roman. Well, Who's thank you to it? thank you to all of you and thank you for fantastic questions, Pilar, and questions from everybody listening. It's been really stimulating and I hope it inspires everybody to become a, a time rebel to change the to smash the clocks and think long term. Jose Angel, would you like to um, end the session? Muy bien. Yo creo que todos estaremos de acuerdo que ha sido una excelente conversación y estoy seguro de que este diálogo nos ha ayudado, nos ha hecho un poco mejores. Al menos a mí, que soy abuelo de dos preciosas niñas, pues me ha ayudado. ¿eh? Ya las quería mucho y quería que su tiempo fuera mejor que lo que pienso que va a ser, pero ahora voy a luchar con más fuerza. Bien, eh, a los eh, que han participado oyendo y quieran profundizar en lo que aquí se ha hablado, pues yo les recomiendo el libro de Roman Trattari. Está en español, al que quiera practicar inglés está en inglés y creo que está en muchos más idiomas, o sea que 
el, el idioma no es una barrera. También, lo iba a decir yo, pero lo ha dicho él, que un libro anterior de Roman era Carpe Diem, donde estoy seguro, no lo he leído, este sí, pero estoy seguro que eh, no se habla de aprovechar el tiempo y olvidarse de todo, sino aprovechar el momento. También he tomado nota de ese libro. Y bueno, esperamos expectantes el nuevo libro de Roma que nos ha anunciado. ¿eh? Muchas gracias a Román, muchas gracias Pilar por un diálogo tan interesante y nada más, yo voy a decir que el siguiente diálogo que vamos a tener será con una persona también muy interesante, Yayo Herrero, Yayo Herrero ha escrito muchos estudios y algún libro, concretamente el libro que nos vamos a focalizar es Los cinco elementos, The Five Elements, será el 13 de diciembre, como en ocasiones anteriores en esta a las 6.30 y esperamos a todas y todos los que habéis asistido que repitáis la asistencia. Nada más, muchas gracias y que terminéis muy felices el día.